There are any number of fascinating people in the energy industry that I've interviewed over the years. And one of them uh, that I'd we're gonna interview today is Amanda Hall. And she is the CEO of Summit Nanotech, a clean tech firm that's centered in, in uh, Calgary, Alberta. Welcome to the interview, Amanda. Thanks, Markham. Happy to be here. Now you have a very interesting company and about an even more interesting, I think, background. How you got? So you got you went to the University of Toronto. You got one degree. You came out west to Calgary. You then raised a family, and while you were doing that, you went back to school and got another degree. I mean, and then you went into the industry and had a, a successful career before leaving it to form Summit Nanotech. Tell us that story. I I find that very interesting. It is, it is an interesting story. And oddly, my father often says that this was the story of how not to do, uh, how not to do growing up because I did have kids in the middle of, of growing my, uh, my, my academic career. So um, yeah, I started off in University of Toronto, took four years of biology, but had a minor in physics. And uh, what happened at the end of four years of biology is I decided I didn't like biology and I loved physics. And so I, I got the degrees. Uh, I had a minor in physics and a minor in English as well as a major in biology. So I got those degrees and left and moved out to Calgary. There weren't any jobs in Toronto at the time. So I was just chasing a job. Landed in Calgary, learned about the oil and gas sector and really had my first introduction to geophysics, um, which is the, it's the application of physics to understanding the earth essentially. And so, um, but at that point I started having kids, got married, you know, like I did it backwards in a way, but for me, it worked really well because having my kids very young, I was 23 when I had my first baby. Um, and then I went back to school and I, I did a geophysics degree. I would like bring my kids to school with me. One day, one of them had pink eye and I dragged them into a lecture at the university and the prof like stopped the lecture and said, is that a baby back there? <laughs> so it was really fascinating. <laughs> But I got the degree uh, and then I launched uh, my career into um, environmental geophysics was my first job. And then from there, I moved into potash mining. And then from there, I moved into oil and gas. Now, you were working for one of the largest oil and gas companies, CNRL, when I met you in 2018. And uh, I, I, you, I know you told me stories about how you would bring out new ideas. And big companies just aren't great at, you know, welcoming new ideas all the time. And that's kind of what led you to uh, start Summit Nanotech. Have I got that correct? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so some companies promote uh, entrepreneurship. So uh, yeah, like a kind of a growth of an innovation, innovative culture inside a company rather than outside of the company. Um, but it's challenging to do that when you have a behemoth company like a CNRL. Um, they're just, they're so big and they really don't have the resources or the capacity to develop technology it really does belong in their mindset in a university or something along those lines. So um, ideas that came up at CNRL were just kind of like, well, it's not really our place to develop that. So, so ultimately I couldn't turn my brain off. And so I ended up just leaving the company and starting my own startup and, and started developing my own technology. Well, let's talk about that technology. It's a nanotech membrane that filters out lithium from fluids. Give us a little background on how you got started and, and um, uh, what the technology actually does. Sure, so, and actually this is where my biology roots come back into play because I modeled the process after the human kidney when I, when I first started out. <clears throat> and I, luckily I won uh, the Women in Clean Tech Challenge um, finalist position, which gave me access to a government lab so we got to move into the NRCAN CAMET Energy Facility in Devon, Alberta, and we started making membranes. And uh, I'd never done anything like this before. So I hired uh, I hired chemists for a chemical engineer with a master's in nanotechnology, and I relied on the government researchers to help me get started taking this concept really of of filtering and concentrating lithium um, and turning it into a scalable industrial product tons of challenges along the way. Um, and none of, not the least of which was COVID-19, which shut the doors of the lab and booted us out. So at that point, we started our own lab in Bears Paw, in, just outside of Calgary. And we kept working on the membrane concept, but we also incorporated a, a preliminary step to, to put in before the membrane, which is a sorbent. 
And so a sorbent uh, is, it's lithium selective and it's like a sponge that sucks lithium out of brine water. So that is the, that is the heavy lifter in our process, the sorbent, but the membrane still exists to do the filtration as a second step. So it's, it's interesting how the technology has evolved. It's a seven step process. And those first two steps are really the unique physics uh, behind extracting lithium from brine water. Now, you and I have chatted in the past about how this technology is not necessarily applicable to produced water that comes from oil and gas wells in the, in the industry, but uh, uh, does work really well in Chile, for instance, where uh, I think you've done some of your initial work. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so unfortunately, Alberta's brine is, has a low concentration of lithium, and so the cost to get it out is just too high. So it's uh, it's not a physics it's not a physics problem. Like we can get it out, but it's going to cost more to get it out than it is to sell the lithium to the market. So as lithium prices come up, and as our technology becomes more economic or becomes more efficient, more effective, and we can lower our op costs, as those two things happen, someday, like it's like fracking, right? Like someday, it can be an economic endeavor to get lithium out of Alberta brine. Um, but not today, it's just too expensive today. So, but in Chile, concentrations are 10 times higher and there's no hydrocarbons mixed in with the brine. So much, much easier to take a raw product into our system, extract the lithium, responsibly dispose of the waste and not have to worry about dealing with messy oil and gas getting mixed up in the process. So where is your company headed? I, I, I was on your site today and, and was very impressed with your team. I mean, you have PhD chemists and, and uh, a, a lot of uh, very smart people around your board table. And uh, so where is, are you going to grow the company? Uh, you know, have you got a major growth in, in mind and, and where are you going to get the talent? Yeah, so we're, we're growing quickly. Um, I predict we'll double in size in the next year, um, which means we're going from 10 people to 20 people. So we're still small, but uh, yeah, we have a fantastic advisory board, um, lithium uh, industry experts on the board, as well as really bright clean tech business people who are able to help guide the, st the strategy behind my decision making in, in the clean tech sector. So uh, it's like uh, it's like taking. Um, all of the experience from oil and gas uh, and then morphing it into a clean tech endeavor that that is, it's different, but it's the same. So resource extraction is resource extraction. You gotta do it responsibly and doing it sustainably is like the new business model. Without sustainability in your business model, you're not gonna succeed anymore. So you need to, you need to make sure that's in there too. So the resource base I'm drawing from in terms of employees and growing my company, they are oil and gas experts, ex lithium, or sorry, resource extraction experts who can take that knowledge and just pivot it into a new sector and, and then use all that skill and knowledge to, to make lithium extraction better. That, that's fascinating. And uh, give us a, just a, a brief overview of where you think the company is going to go in the next five or 10 years. Oh, I've got a I've got a billion dollar revenue plan in mind. So, uh, it, you know, it's not that it's not that challenging to achieve either. So in my sales forecast with a hardware as a service business model. So it, it's kind of an oil and gas business model where I show up on the lithium miners site with my equipment and I put it down and we attach it to a well and it starts uh, it starts extracting lithium. So it's above ground surface technology. Um, but it's hardware as a service. So I own and operate and maintain that technology and the customer pays me an operating fee and that's it. So the operating budget from the lithium mining company gets transferred to me. I use it to pay back the capital I spent getting the technology to the field. And then with a five-year contract or a 10-year contract or a 20-year contract, whatever it is they're willing to provide to us which is about the life cycle of a, of a lithium basin is about 20, 20 to 25 years. So as long as my hardware stays on site, maintained, always upgraded, always cutting edge technology. And this is the beautiful thing about modular technology is I can continuously remain at the leading edge of innovation by swapping out pieces of the modules and never have the technology go obsolete. Uh, so that helps the miner and it helps us stay on the cutting edge and keep our op costs always getting driven down lower and our technology performance always being optimized. 
So anyway, with six customers, I will be making a billion dollars a year in revenue within the next five years. And so that's, they call it a unicorn, like it's a unicorn status, um, but that's the, that's the plan and it's very achievable with the, with the plan I have in place today, with the strategy I have in place today. Well, and it's particularly impressive because um, with lithium ion being, or lithium being uh, the main component of, of batteries these days, and the rapid growth we're gonna see in, in, ba in battery usage uh, in electric vehicles and utility storage and so on. I mean, you're perfectly placed uh, to provide that raw material. And so that, terrific. And uh, sounds like a very exciting for, for the company. Uh, final question, and I'm, I'm also uh, very impressed with the way that you've emerged as kind of a spokesperson for the clean tech industry. I, every time I go on LinkedIn, Amanda Hall's appearing in another you know, conference or presentation. And what's that been like for you? It's humbling, really. Like I, uh, I, 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 I taught myself nanotechnology and I learned about the lithium marketplace on my living room couch, you know, like I, I'm not an expert in this field, yet I'm being deemed as an expert in this field because I'm so passionate about it. And I jumped in with both feet. So essentially, I, I let go of the rope of oil and gas and said, I'm done with you and landed in a lithium space and just devoured the, the knowledge. I was a sponge. I sponged it all up. I, I used a lot of my knowledge and my decision making, sorry, abilities from oil and gas to put a plan in place for lithium that was unlike what, what my competition is doing. Uh, and so because of that, I was, I was really quick to differentiate and, and stand out. So uh, and then, of course, having environmental um, priorities in my in my technology development and making sure that we comply with regulation and what the government want and what the people want in the future. Like we're humans and the humanity behind the growth of an electric vehicle sector and the use of lithium ion batteries and renewable energy storage and e-mobility like that's that's a human driver. Like that's not something the banks aren't driving it. It's not institutions driving it. It's the people driving it. And so there's something really beautiful about that and being able to honor that, honor our humanity in the sense that we need to do sustainable mining. We need to, we need to create the mine of the future. And I'm so passionate about this and so excited about it and so confident that we can get there that I think I just naturally gravitated to be a spokesperson for clean tech and mining coming together. And, uh, and, and then because I'm a woman, <laughs> I just get that, that woman in clean tech kind of role um, thrust upon me. So it is what it is. Uh, I'm a female. I'm a clean tech CEO. And I love, I love what my company's doing. It's, my team is fantastic. We've got the right motivation and the right vision and the right values driving all of our decision making. Amanda, uh, good luck in the future. It sounds like uh, you've got a very exciting few years ahead. And we'll look forward to uh, interviewing you in the not too distant future and hearing about more about your adventures and successes. Thanks, Marco.